So um, what I would hope is that with this very quick explanations that I gave, suddenly lots of things about sound will make sense. Okay. And so let me give you a couple of examples of applications. So one is the the, the general case of the acoustics. In, in this case, it's a simple experiment that's quite uh, standard, I think, in people who study acoustics, uh, in which you put a, a speaker on one side of a tube, and it's an open tube on the other side. But what I want you to do is to imagine almost that this is like a room. And so these speakers on the edge is a simple version of a room. It's a closed space. So because you have a boundary condition, walls, and maybe an open wall even, uh, you have constraints that again makes gives you some kind of standing waves. Okay. So here in this particular case, you have the pressure wave that moves here and the displacement of the air that moves down here. So what I want to point out is that if you point, put a microphone in different places here, you will listen to completely different things. So that's exactly the same thing that is happening in an acoustic space. That's one of the reasons why uh, perfectly symmetrical rooms are terrible for acoustical purposes usually. Because you, there's another natural resonant frequencies of the room, you know, natural frequencies in which the air inside the room will like to vibrate. So no matter what you're playing, you always have like a sounding of game or something like that, or a combination of these, right? So you don't want that, you want a neutral room, so you want to kill that. So that's a technical aspect that, you know, if you understand the physics behind it, you suddenly, it all makes sense. But um, I think that there's something more to think about that, uh, which is the fact that in some ways, if you think about it, you're pulsed in a straight state. And it's just propagating perturbation that oscillates. Because of the boundary conditions, it generates a standing wave and a combination of notes that are being generated. Right? These then kick the molecules of air that start propagating around the room. But when these molecules of air hit the boundaries of the room, suddenly they also find their natural frequencies and they start bouncing in a strange way. Well, they dissipate sort of later, of course, but they start bouncing in a strange way. So in many ways, this is you know, sometimes people say that your acoustic space is part of the instrument you're playing, or it's very important for the texture of the instrument. This is telling you that it's, 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 it's not only an image, it's, it's true. You know, you're actually, when I'm creating, when I'm pulsating a string or whatever, I'm creating all these um, series of vibration and resonances that are coming back to me, in which I'm embedded and which I'm generating at the same time. And I think it's a nice way to think about it, and the fact that it's, uh, uh, strongly rooted on the physics behind it is, is quite uh, strong. The other very common effect is the Doppler effect that people discuss. And then again, it's obvious, right? If you have a siren and a car is advancing, what happens is that the car is going to catch up the siren sound that's going on ahead of it. And because it's squeezing its, um, its uh, oscillations in front of it, suddenly you have a higher frequency and therefore a higher pitch. Right? And the ones that are being left behind are being stretched because it's running away from them. So that's what, you know, when, the, when there's an ambulance that comes and it does do 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 and it passes you and do 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 that's, we're all familiar with that. Well, like, you know, of the cars in front of one. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, on the other side, uh, it's kind of interesting that um, if you think about it, if you reach the actual speed of sound, what will happen? You have suddenly that all the <coughs> waves that are in front of in front of them, they will all be collapsed in one position, right? Because you're going exactly at the, at the right speed for the speed of sound. So I don't know if any of you have read, but at the beginning of aviation, when people were trying to reach uh, Mach 1, which was the speed of sound, they had all these troubles because suddenly your whole airplane starts going crazy because the whole vibration is being accumulated right over it. Right? This doesn't have the space to spread out. And then finally, there's a very standard way to look at the physics of music that I intentionally didn't want to look so much at it because this is just connected to the notes. And while notes are an essential part of music, of course, um, I, I, I'm a strong believer that um, one of the important things about the music that I do is that it doesn't only concentrate on that, but concentrate a lot also on the sounds, and the, in the architecture, and the mixing, and the creation of spaces, etc. But, uh, but uh, the notes of the Western uh, scales are very are very uh, mathematically based. So what you have is that you have your basic C there at the bottom set. I'm going to go very quickly through this, which will be in the case of one string, you have that just one oscillation, the main oscillation. And then if you go double that, you immediately go one octave higher okay, to the next C. Right? And then if you do three oscillations now with, with all these notes like that, then you suddenly get to the G. Okay? 
And then if you go for oscillation, well, that's double again. So then again, it's a C, right? Now you get a five oscillation, that's an E. Okay, and the interesting thing is that then you have C, uh, E, G, you know, which is the most, the simplest, <coughs> most harmonic chord. So in fact, the fact that this is the simplest, most harmonic chord is simply because it is usually embedded in any string that you, that you, that you plug, right? Because all these other modes will be created. So anything that's vibrated will contain that somehow. And as such, uh, it is already there. It, your ear is programmed to listen to it, so it sounds nice. Right? And then if you continue going a little further, well, again, this time it's six, so you go again two times three, so you go to another G. But then you get to the to the B, so it's the seventh. So, so then suddenly you, you have the, the first alteration of the most basic chord. Right? So there's clearly a connection between what we find uh, to sound good and the physics behind it. And I'm just going to finish with this, which is a little diagram of the ear. Uh, the ear is fascinating, and people have been studying it quite recently from dynamical system perspective, people working here is not so far away from what I do. Uh, because in fact, the, tra the, the translation from sound to uh, nervous impulses is not trivial at all. Um, but probably most of us study in the school that there's these, all these little bones that bring the, the vibrations inside your ear, etc., etc. But the question is, how does it go from there to your nerves? And in fact, it has nothing to do with how a microphone works. Uh, in fact, in this case, it uses all these physical aspects of, of sound that I was just describing. So it, there's all these little hairs that are in this little chamber, and they resonate with different frequencies. So in some way, your ear is already doing a, the composition in frequencies when you're hearing. Because as one resonates, it gives the right kick for you know, the neural input, impulse. And, and there's this membrane, so if, it, if the sound resonates on one side or on the other side, you will get different feeling. And, different neurons are connected to these little vibrating hairs which are tuned to different notes, literally. So therefore, when you're listening, it's not just like in a microphone, one thing that is vibrating and producing an electric signal, it's much more sophisticated than that. There's a bunch of little sensors that are tuned to different notes. And that's one of the reasons why our, our, our hearing is so much more sophisticated than a microphone, its capacity of capturing sound. Uh, in particular, anybody who's worked with microphones, you know that as soon as you get close, farther, you, you know, the sound changes completely. While instead, in the case of the ear, you can hear you know, a jet plane and somebody whispering, and you can manage to make the difference. Yeah. And on top of it, it's active. Each one of these little hairs is literally being stimulated all the time, so it's right next to jump into its, its, its um, resonance, essentially, right? And then, so then it can be very easily stimulated in that way. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> this is a bear uh, it survived in the present day, mostly in Brazil. Uh, it's just a color called capoeira. So, so if, I, if, I, if I follow through what I was just telling you before, what's happening here, right? So he's kicking the string, the string is generating a note because it's constrained, right? So it has its natural frequencies of oscillation. While it's vibrating, it's kicking the little molecules of air that are going towards my ear, but that's not the main source of the sound because it's just a little string. What's happening then is that this is going through the whole stick. The whole stick is vibrating and through this link that gets in this pinky there. And from there to the rest of the um, box, I don't know what it's called. And uh, which again produces these standing waves inside it because the air will oscillate and it's constrained inside that space. So that will be part of the texture again of the sound. And you can see that very clearly because when he pulls it against his, his, his body, uh, the, the way the sound bounces off his body will produce a different kind of texture.